I do have to give Mitch McConnell credit. There was a moment yesterday in the news cycle where Mitch McConnell really got a chance to, to shine. And so this is another tie-in to the state of Alabama, oddly enough. So twice he's been in the Alabama uh, news cycle. It turns out that Senator McConnell, in his past, in his ancestry, he is a descendant of people from Alabama who were slave owners. So back when slavery was a thing in Alabama, some of Mitch McConnell's ancestors owned slaves, and they were able to prove this the other day. So this became a thing. They had a story written about it, and they actually asked Mitch McConnell about this in uh, in the press the other day, and so here's how that went. Were you aware that your great-great-grandfathers were slave owners in Alabama uh, before the Civil War, and has that revelation caused you to change your position? You know, I find myself, once again, in the same position as President Obama. We both oppose reparations, and we both are the descendants of slaveholders. <laughs> okay, before, before I come back on screen, I know I'm just leaving you with a freeze frame of Mitch McConnell, but I have to point this out. You gotta love Mitch McConnell's reaction to this. Look, look at that grin that he's got going on right there. Look at that. <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> Mitch McConnell, he's got that little grin on him. Mitch McConnell is so stoic and stone-faced most of the time. And I mean, most of the time, McConnell is just kind of a block of wood. But occasionally, he's got a joke. And... He when he pulls off a joke and he, you know that he's practiced that, that he knew that somebody was going to ask him about that at some point during the day. And so he had prepared an answer for it. The thing is, I love that Mitch McConnell has the world's worst poker face <laughs> when it comes to that, <laughs> because when it, when it comes to McConnell, uh, he's kind of like that kid in seventh grade that he either planted a whoopee cushion in a teacher's chair or had planted a cherry bomb somewhere. And he was that kid that got everybody else in trouble because he couldn't keep a straight face when his joke was about to hit. So like, um, <laughs> he would be the kid that the teacher's about to shut, uh, sit down and he's about to ruin it because he can't quit smirking. He's just got the world's worst poker face. So he knows that the joke is coming. He knows that he's about to, to nail it. And that was a perfect response to that question. It really was about the slave reparations, uh, bringing in President Obama, who also had slaveholders in his ancestry, which is true of a lot of Americans. But just... Uh, <laughs> you, you can tell that he knows the joke is coming. And so he's just like kind of... <clears throat> He can't, he can't hold a straight face. He can't do it. And so it's just, it's hilarious. Mitch McConnell does this all the time. If he's ever going to uh, put forward a joke and the guy's no comedian and he's not exactly known for his wit or his zingers or anything. So when on the, the one rare occasion that he actually has one, Mitch McConnell, old cocaine, Mitch, just doing a line of cocaine and then going out in front of the cameras uh, <laughs> for that. <laughs> But yeah, th this really was the perfect response to it. And what it really highlights, because the question itself is absurd. And so it deserves an absurd answer, which is why would the fact that you have ancestors that own slaves do absolutely anything to change your opinion on slavery reparations? It's an absurd premise and it deserves an absurd response because the, pr presumably, and I'm trying to play middle of the road here just for a moment, let's say that you are for slavery reparations. Presumably the reason for that is because you believe that slavery is wrong and it has somehow, even though it happened 150 years ago, negatively impacted people today in a way that, that, that cannot be overcome. And so you're redistributing wealth from the people that own slaves. Well, I mean, because it's the ancestors of people who own slaves, it's not actually the people that own slaves. You're taking money from the descendants of slave owners to give it to 
the descendants of people who were slaves and and somehow that's justice in their own twisted mind. But nonetheless, that's the premise that they're going to. Uh, somehow you can be held accountable for the the wrongdoing of your ancestors, and that's really what it goes back to. If you believe that the sins of your father are transferable, in other words, that you have to pay for the wrongs of people and generations that came before you, that ideology is the only thing that could really have this sort of transferable guilt ideology set to it. And because of that, that doesn't change whether or not your ancestors committed these acts or not. Whether you are someone that does or does not have slave owners in their ancestry makes no difference whatsoever into whether or not you believe that a person should be held accountable for crimes committed by his ancestors or not. There was a time where the average person in this country standard, and I think the average person in this country, that this is still their standard, it's just the people that are the most radical or the loudest, and they're getting the most press right now. But the standard used to be, you are responsible for your actions. That was it. You weren't responsible for your ancestors' actions, and your ancestors weren't responsible for your actions. If you're a grown man and your grown son commits a crime, they don't punish you. And if you're a grown man, and you commit a crime, or your father commits a crime, they don't punish you for that either. That's the legal standard that we all used to believe in, and the legal standard that we thought ought to be the way that you were judged. You were judged based on what you do, not based on what your parents do. Not based on what your ancestors do. But somewhere along the line, we decided that that was no longer acceptable, and I don't understand why. Dr. Martin Luther King's standard was, don't judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I'm fine being judged based on the content of my character. In fact, I do believe that people ought to be judged based on the content of their character, and that is specifically why I take great pains to protect my character. And that's why in this country... Back then, when that was the standard, that's the reason that people thought a lot more of their reputation and their character, because they thought that that's how people should be judged. Not by the color of their skin, not by all these surrounding, uh, frankly, irrelevant details. In the same way that I wouldn't want to be judged if my father or mother were a serial killer, and you know, people could think badly of me, but being able to actually take some kind of action against me or that they could do something to me because of something one of my relatives did, that's absolutely absurd. And so this has really become the new standard, unfortunately. You should have no pride in your achievements because government did that. You remember Barack Obama saying, well, if you built something, if you are a successful business person and have a company, you didn't build that. Somebody else did that. The government did that. The collective did that. That if you've built anything, if you've accomplished something, that's not really you. And this is the new standard that we've come to. And also, you should have no shame for your folly. There should be no consequences to any of the stupid decisions that you've made. If you want to sit around in your underwear and eat Cheetos all day, even though you're perfectly capable of working, oh well, doesn't matter, we'll take care of you. I've had conversations with people on the left where they said, well, yeah, there's some lazy people, but they shouldn't be held accountable for their laziness. Really? That the, They shouldn't starve just because they're lazy. Uh, yeah, actually they should. Because here's the thing. Eventually they'll get hungry enough to not be lazy. But that aside, you see where all this is going. Used to, everybody's held accountable for their own actions. You get rewarded if you do what's right. You get punished if you do what's wrong. And you're just judged based on what you do. The left has completely flipped that on its head. Now what they're saying is, you don't take pride in any of your accomplishments because government did that. And if you screw up, that was society's fault. That's not you. That's why we're saying that people that are felons in prison, they ought to be voting because it's not really their fault. That was society's fault. That if... We have a whole bunch of people in jail, or we have a whole bunch of people being punished. 
well, here we have a whole bunch of people impoverished. That's not really their fault. That's society's fault. If we have a bunch of teenagers running around, killing each other, shooting up schools, well, that's not really their fault. That's society's fault. We should have taken the guns away from them. We should have done this. We should have done that. No, no. People make their own decisions. And you cannot get away from that. See, now the only thing that you should be ashamed of or the only thing that you're allowed to take pride in are things that you didn't do. The only thing that you can be proud of is if you're gay or if you are the descendant of slaves or the descendant of black people or Asian people or immigrants or Mexicans or Hispanics of other kind. That's the only thing you're allowed to actually take pride in. And the only thing that you're allowed to be ashamed for is if you come from the opposite side. That if you're one of what the woke people would call privileged, the only thing that you should be ashamed of is the fact that you're white. The only thing that you should be ashamed of is that you come from a rich family. You see, now we're flipping the whole thing on its head. You shouldn't be ashamed of or proud of anything that you personally did, but you should be ashamed of or proud of something that society did to you or from your upbringing. Those are things that you can be ashamed of or you can have pride in. We've, we're living in an absolutely upside-down world, and all of this is an outcropping of collectivist thinking, that you're not an individual, you're not a person, you're not a free-thinking adult. You are a cog in the machine, and that is the only way that you can land anywhere in the philosophical ballpark, anywhere near all of this nonsense. You see, I think that this is one of the main reasons that we are given the lineage of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Now, there's other important reasons, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, which was primarily written to the Jews. They wanted to be sure that the prophecy was fulfilled and that Jesus was indeed the offspring of King David. And I understand that there are other implications in that as well. But I think a big part of it, and I think it's really interesting what the Bible does with some of the footnotes and some of the, the things that it brings up in that genealogy. If you've ever read through it in the, the first part of the Gospel of Matthew there, you'll notice that a lot of people in the Lord's lineage were not necessarily great people. You've got people like David, sure. You have people going all the way back to Adam. You have Abraham. You have Judah. But it's important to note that not everybody in Christ's lineage was necessarily a Bible hero. You've also got people like Rahab. You also have people like Bathsheba, who married David after he murdered her husband so that he could be with her. Now, David had several wives. God could have had Jesus come from the lineage of any of them. And yet, he chose Solomon, the son of Bathsheba. See, there's a powerful lesson in there. And this is a biblical principle going all the way back to the Law of Moses. That the sins of the father shall not be visited upon the son, and the, the sins of the son shall not be visited upon the father. Correct moral teaching and you don't need the Bible to get there, but the Bible certainly talks about it. Correct moral teaching and basic human logic and intelligence would tell you you do not hold people accountable for things that their ancestors did. And that's where this whole thing goes completely wrong with the slavery reparations. It doesn't treat people like individuals. It treats them like a large collective. And when you treat people like a collective as opposed to an individual that is held responsible for their own actions then it makes perfect sense in the mind of a collectivist to punish a group and reward a group and not treat them like individuals. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.